Good evening, everybody. Christ is in our midst. Good strength as we begin the Advent fast, the Nativity fast, also called St. Philip's fast. We are on our way to Christmas now. Uh, and I know that that is exciting to all of you. And this year, we are doing uh, something a little bit different on Wednesday evenings instead of Vespers, which is uh, typical for us here at Dormition. We're having evening prayers. Uh, and then I'll be telling the story of a life of one of the saints from the Jesse tree. Uh, what's the Jesse tree? Well, in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord and will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And it says a little later on, that the nations will, that in, that in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. So, who is Jesse? The root of Jesse. The root of Jesse is Christ. And Christmas is the celebration of his birth into the world. But who is this Jesse that he comes from, that he is from the root of? Well, that's what I intend to tell you tonight. Samuel was the prophet in Israel. And Israel had asked for a king. And so God gave them a king. He gave them King Saul. But King Saul, as I told you on Sunday in another story, disobeyed the Lord and did something wicked, taking the place of the high priest for himself in his impatience. And so God said, I will not give the kingdom to Saul and to his descendants. I will take it away and give it to another. Samuel was very grieved by all of this. And God came to Samuel one day and he said, Samuel, how long are you going to grieve over Saul? He said, I need you to anoint another king. And Samuel said, uh, I'm pretty sure if I do that, Saul will kill me. And God said, don't you worry about that. I've got a plan. I want you to go down to Bethlehem and I want you to make a sacrifice there. And when you get there, gather the men of the city to, uh, to consecrate themselves for this sacrifice. So Samuel said, all right, here I go. And Samuel made his way on foot down to Bethlehem. And when he arrived outside the city... Samuel had kind of a reputation. The men of the city came out and said, Do you come in peace? Samuel was not a man to be trifled with. And he said, Yes, I come in peace. I have come to make a sacrifice. Now gather the men of the city. Please come and cons uh, let me consecrate you for this sacrifice. And among those men was an old man named Jesse, one of the leaders of the town of Bethlehem. Now Jesse had seven sons, and this was the plan that God had. When Jesse came to the sacrifice, all of his sons would be presented to Samuel to be consecrated, to participate. And Samuel was sure that somehow he would know which one was the right one. And so Jesse shows up for the sacrifice with his sons in tow. And the first is tall, strapping good-looking young man. His name is Eliab. And Samuel sees Eliab and he goes, Aha! He's a good-looking fellow. Tall, strong. Looks like he'd be a good king. This must be the guy. And God said, It's not him. Man looks on the outward appearance, but I judge by the heart. And so the second son 
Abinadab comes before Samuel, and Samuel is hmm, also strong. Not bad. And God says, mm -mm. Shema, the third son, comes before Samuel. And Samuel's doing the work of consecrating and getting everything ready, and he's talking to God the whole time, and God says, not him either. <laughs> Number four. At this point in the story, they're not even naming them anymore. <laughs> Number four comes before Samuel. Nope. Number five. Mm -mm. Number six. Try again. And that's all the ones that are there. And Samuel says, Is this all of them? And he's saying to God, You said it was true, it's the tribe of Jesse! I've seen them all, it's none of them, you keep telling me no, what are we going to do? And Jesse said, Well, I do have one other son, the youngest of them all, but he's kind of runty and young, and he's back tending the sheep back home. We didn't even bring him. And Samuel says, maybe you'd do me a kindness and go get him. And so they send one of the other boys and they run and they get the youngest son of Jesse, a boy named David. Now it said David was a healthy looking lad and ruddy, which means kind of red. You know, he had lots of blood in him. He's a kind of an enthusiastic boy. Strong, but small. And when he comes before Samuel, Sam, God says to Samuel, This is my anointed. Anoint him to be the next king of Israel. And Samuel offers the sacrifice. And he anoints David to the astonishment of everyone and the annoyance of six older brothers. who don't forget it right away. Now, we have to skip over from chapter 16 of 1 Samuel to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. At this time, Judah was under the thumb of the Philistines. And Saul was doing his best to battle back. And Saul had arrayed all of his armies on one hill overlooking a valley. And the Philistines had arrayed all of their army on the other hill overlooking that same valley. And every day, they would all come out and they would line up in battle lines and they would huff and they would puff like men do. And they would bang their swords on their shields and they would shout ugly things at each other. And then they'd all go back to their camps and sit down. And the reason they did that is that every day, out of the Philistine camp, out of this tent, came the most enormous man you can imagine. The scripture said he stood six cubits and a span tall, which is at least eight and a half feet. And he was a mountain of a man, not just tall, but enormous. It said he wore armor of bronze, and bronze is heavy. It said it weighed 500 shekels, his breastplate. His spear had a, head, a spearhead, 600 shekels of iron, a javelin that he carried on his back, and he had a helmet that came down over on the top of his head, and he had a servant just to carry his shield in the off chance that he ever needed it. And every day, when those two armies came out and they lined up across from each other, Goliath of Gath, that mountain of a man, would come out and he would stand up at his full height and he would take that spear in his hand with his servant standing there before him and he would pounded on the ground, and he would shout in a thundering voice, Let your champion, sons of Saul, come and fight me. Let's settle this between the two of us, and if your man wins, we will serve you. But if I win, you will serve us, all of you. 
And whenever Goliath of Gath came out and made his challenge, the men of Israel shook in their shoes and their knees quaked and their voices got small. And not one of them ever dared to set foot across that line and to challenge Goliath of Gath. And he would stand over there and he would rail at them and insult them and mock them, beg one of them to come out and fight. And they would hang their heads in shame and go back to their tents. Well, David was not one of the men of Israel who was sent up to fight in Saul's army. He was much too young and runty. However, those three older brothers, the ones who are important enough to get names, they were all in the army of Goliath, or of, of Saul. And one day, Jesse said to David, he said, David, I've packed up this donkey with supplies for your brothers. Take it up there to where, the, where, they're, where they're camped, and then... Let me know how things go. Bring me back some news of what's going on there. How goes the battle? So David took the donkey, and he made his way from his father's lands there at Bethlehem all the way up to where the battle was. And he came in to the camp just at the time that the men of Israel had lined up, and he walked up just in time to see across from them that man that mountain of a man, Goliath, come out of his tent and roar his challenge like a Brahma bull across the camp of the Israelites. Now David, they didn't mention that he was ruddy for no reason. He was a kind of a eager, maybe some might say hot-tempered little guy. And he heard Goliath roar out that challenge and he waited, and he waited to see whether somebody was going to take him up on it. And after a minute, he saw that nobody was, and he was huh, hot under the collar. And he said out loud, well, isn't somebody going to, are you just going to let him talk to you like that? Are you going to let him defy the God of the armies of Israel? Are you going to let him just get away with that? Some, who's going to fight him? And the men of Israel just kind of ignored him. But his oldest brother, Eliab, said, Shut your mouth, you. You're nothing but a page boy who came up here to bring us some food. But I see what it is. You want to stay and be nosy and pay attention to the battle. Well, you should just get yourself on home. So David, ever the impertinent one, turned around and said the very same thing to the next person that would listen. What is going on around here? Are you all just going to let him talk to you like that? Are you going to allow him to defy the God of the armies of Israel? And he said, I'll fight him. You just let me at him. I'll fight him right now. Well, I don't know exactly who it was. But somebody went and told Saul that there was a hot young man out there who was just ready to go fight Goliath. And they brought him into the king. And as soon as he came in, Saul's face fell. He was expecting an eager young warrior. What he saw was a runty little guy, a shepherd boy, with his shepherd's staff and his little shepherd's satchel over his shoulder, his little knapsack there. A ruddy, wild-haired little guy who'd obviously spent a lot of time out in the woods and out in the crags and the meadows. And David said to Saul what he'd said to everybody else. Let me at him. You can't just let him defy the God of the armies of Israel. I'll fight him right now. And Saul said, And what exactly do you think you would do against that man? You're nothing but a shepherd boy. And he said, I may be just a shepherd boy. But I'll have you know that once a lion came out of the woods and tried to steal my sheep, and I killed that lion. And I'll have you know that another time a bear came right down out of the woods and tried to steal my sheep, my father's sheep. Do you think he got one? Not one sheep. I killed that bear too. I have killed the lion 
and I have killed the bear, and God will deliver that Goliath of Gath into my hand as well. Saul paused a moment to consider this. And then he said to his, one of his servants, Bring my armor. They brought out all of Saul's armor. Now you'll recall that one of the things that Saul had going for him when he was made king was that he was, by their standards, very tall and kind of regal looking. A big, powerful man by the standards of the time. David, did we mention that he was runty? <laughs> so they take David off behind a curtain and they dress him up in Saul ar Saul's armor. And he comes out and he's got, he looks like me. He's got a breastplate that's hanging down to his knees. He's got a helmet that's down over his eyes. He can't see where he's going. He's got a sword that's dragging the ground and a spear that's twice as tall as he is. And he's struggling to walk. He looks like somebody dressed up for Halloween. Ridiculous. And he says, With all respect, King Saul, this armor, well, I haven't really tested it out. And I think maybe I'd be better off without it. <clears throat> and Saul looks at him and goes, hmm, maybe you're right. So they take the armor off of him. And he says, I'll go out just like I am. The time comes for the armies to line up again. And they line up. And Goliath of Gath comes pounding forward. Issues his challenge. And then to his great astonishment, squeezing between the shoulders of two soldiers, comes a little boy. Looks to him like a little boy. With a shepherd's staff in one hand and a little knapsack over his shoulder, and a little sling in the other hand. Now a sling, if you don't know, is a little pouch of leather, and it's got strings attached to two ends. They're long. And what you do is you hold it by both sets of strings. You put a little rock in the pouch, and you hold it by both sets of strings, and you swing it in a circle real fast, and then you let go of one set of strings so that that pouch flies open. And that rock flies out like a little missile. Now, people could be really amazingly good with those slings. But here's this little guy. And he steps out right in front. And Goliath looks and he kind of squints. And David keeps walking forward toward him. And his eyes get bigger. And then he starts to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> is this the best that Israel has to send out against Goliath of Gath? Is this your mighty champion? Little boy, I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds when I'm done with you. David looks up at him and he says in his David voice, which is kind of small compared to Goliath's, You come to me with a spear and a sword and a javelin, but I come to you with the Spirit of the Lord. And this day God will deliver you into my hands, and I will cut your head off, and then I will feed your body to the birds of the air. Goliath has now had enough of the jest, and he starts to lumber out. Spear in hand, he's going to come up and he's going to run David right through with that spear as soon as he can get within ten feet of him. David picks up five smooth stones from the brook, puts four of them in his pouch, takes the fifth one and puts it into that sling. Here comes Goliath. Boom, boom, boom. And here comes David, walking forward with that apprising eye of a man who knows what his business is. 
and he eyes it up and he's swinging that sling in a circle. Slowly at first, measuring his steps, measuring the pace of his opponent as he walks forward, timing everything. And Goliath gets closer and closer, and the sling swings faster and faster and faster. And just then, whoo, David lets it go, and there's nothing. You don't hear any sound at all. And then all of a sudden, there's a boom. And Goliath goes kind of cross-eyed. And then he falls, face first, down onto the ground, right in front of David. Nobody can believe it. The people of Israel gasp. The armies of the Philistines gasp. David goes, woohoo! <laughs> and then he climbs up and he stands up on top of Goliath. And he pulls that giant sword out of Goliath's sheath. It's so huge he can barely carry it. He drags it along and then he takes it and whoa, cuts the head right off Goliath. And at that point, the Philistines panic and they begin to run away. And the army of the people of Israel rushes up all around David and they pass him and they chase the, the people of the Philistines all the way to the gates of Ekron killing them all along the way, and it says in the scriptures that the bodies of the Philistines who were killed were feast for the birds of the air. And that was the first great victory of David, the son of Jesse. David had many, many adventures after that. And I'm very sad to say that he became a great enemy of Saul. Saul became very jealous of David and did not want him around, and tried to kill him more than once. But what God plans can never be thwarted entirely. And David did, eventually, when Saul died, become the king. And he was a great warrior king for the nation of Israel. And he drove the enemies from the land, and he helped them to build up the city of David, the city of Jerusalem. And he wanted very much when he built that city up to build a great temple for the king, God, the Lord of Israel. He wanted very much to replace the tabernacle with a real temple, a permanent house of, a house of worship for God in Israel. But God said, No, David, you're a man of war with much blood on your hands. That job is not for you. That job will be for someone else. And that someone else proved to be one of the wisest men who ever lived, and I'll tell you about him the next time. God bless you.